Hi, my name is Mike. I make music as Domestic Scene, and this is the second in a two-part video series. In the first video, I showed you how I set up, write, record, and prepare the files for the, uh, for the synth jams that I've been putting up onto YouTube. And in this video, I'm going to take it a little bit further and show you how I edit, mix a little bit more, and ultimately master those tracks if my intention is to put them up onto streaming services like Spotify, SoundCloud, and Bandcamp. Um, uh, it needs to be said that I'm not a professional mix it, mixer mastering engineer, um, but I don't think that most people that will be watching this video are professionals in that regard. Um, we're all just doing the best we can with the knowledge that we have, uh, and hopefully me sharing what I know is a good starting point for somebody, or you can just take my perspective and add it in with the rest of everything else that, that you've learned over time. And... Uh, Hopefully it's helpful. So yeah, if you do find something of value in this uh, video, feel free. It would, it would be really nice if you subscribe to the channel. Um, otherwise, if you have questions about what I'm doing, you can leave those down in the comments and I'm happy to get back to you on that. Um, and yeah, so quick plug, I did just finish an album. Uh, it's called Imperfectionist and that's currently available on Bandcamp. And by the time this video comes out, the first single should also be out. Actually, I know it is because it's coming out tonight at midnight. So the new single's out. Uh, that's uh, Try to Forget, and that should be on streaming services everywhere. So I'll put those links down below. And yeah, with that, let's get to it. Right, so here we have the Ableton Live file that we recorded in the first video. Uh, I removed all of the uh, plugins that I put onto it uh, in that video. Um, I've already exported this file and released this jam on YouTube under the name Particles, so I guess that's the name of this track now. But as we get ready to uh, edit this and get it ready for streaming services, the first thing I want to look at is uh, whether or not there's some area to kind of like shorten it up, tighten it up, and uh, and make it a little bit more of a compact track, because this jam came in at close to eight and a half minutes, which was not what I was expecting at all. Uh, and so maybe it's maybe it's perfect as an eight minute song, but um, I think that we might we we might serve the music best by trying to trim a bit. Um, the first thing I know for sure was that there was a spot at the end where I meant to cut the drums, but one of them was still going, and. So I'm going to listen to the end of this song and see if there's stuff that we can take out here. So I'm kind of paying attention to this drum brute track. Yeah, I see that uh, that open hi-hat sound just keeps going. It's like really distracting. Not what I had in mind. So the first thing we can definitely do is just trim that back. Okay, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna make you sit through it all, but I'll t I'll take a listen to this song and uh, look for some other spots where we can clean it up and see what we end up with. Right, so I finished trimming up this song. Uh, Got it down to about uh, six and a half minutes or so. Uh, could have been a little bit shorter, but I left the <laughs> full minute of feedback at the end of this because I just like it. And uh, yeah, so if you if you look at what I did here, um, primarily I just I took a bunch off the beginning. Uh, originally, it took over a minute and a half to get to where the drums even kicked in, so I wanted to speed that along a little bit. And then I just chopped out some sections kind of to make slightly more dramatic but more compact uh, rises and falls. So it kind of builds up. There's a section where the full drum kit are in, is in. Uh, things drop out, slowly come back in, and uh, 
go through this kind of central section where most of the elements of the song come together, falls apart a little bit down into a pretty mellow section, kicks back up, and then there's just like this whole feedback uh, uh, section that takes it out. Um, yeah, and it's pretty ambient uh, at its core, so I'm totally cool with the length and the massive amount of feedback at the end. So uh, yeah, let's get into uh, mixing this. So uh, I guess the first place I'll start again is just with general balance, since I took out uh, I took out everything that I had done for the YouTube mix. I'm gonna have to go in and just check how things are sitting level wise. I still feel like I did the first time around, like the uh, bulk of the percussion sounds are a little low. So I'm gonna go back and grab the utility and add a little bit of gain. And the reason that I use the utility to add gain instead of just uh, raising up the fader or something like that is that if I end up doing any automation later, it's easier to make a global adjustment with this gain setting once automation is already in there. Uh, so for general balancing, I usually just try to get it all done with gain with the fader levels at zero, and then I can make fine-tune adjustments later if I need to. I guess the next thing I should do is work on, I think typically I would say that I should work on the kick drum first, because that's, that's usually the thing that's driving a song, but I think that with this one, the stereo track from the Deluge has kind of the primary Place. I feel like that's probably where I need to do the most work anyway. So I'm going to try to get that sounding good um, and then adjust the kick to fit. And I just know myself. T I, I tend to record things a little dull and I can hear that in here. So, so the first thing I know I need to do is just give it some high end. And that already sounds a lot better to me. I don't know why I only hear this when I'm mixing. I don't hear it when I'm setting up. put a low cut filter on this just to make sure that I'm not getting any unnecessary uh, noise or rumble on the low end. Giving it a high shelf just to brighten things up and I think I think the the majority of the interest in this song happens kind of in this in this mid-range so you can hear the piano if you see the if you see the the waveform here you can see definitely some really strong peaks from the piano happening there so I wonder if I were to emphasize that just slightly if that would make a difference maybe not quite that much So I'm adding gain with the way that I'm I'm adding this little this little bump here in the mid frequencies and with this high shelf I'm definitely adding gain so I'm gonna go check what's going on with my levels and maybe I'd be better off cutting yeah so flipping back here I can see that I've already pushed my levels 
quite a bit higher. So, let's rethink this. Yeah, I like what I did in theory, but... So I'm just gonna, I think the quicker way to do it is just to drop this down a bit. So I took some gain off with the utility before it hits the EQ. Cause I don't wanna, I don't wanna knock it out of balance. I just wanna be working on the, like the way that the, the, t the tonal balance rather than the level balance. Okay, so for the moment that's sounding better. Um, I'm just gonna double check myself and kind of A-B what I've got. Uh, I think the best way to do that is to put these two, uh, these two effects into an effects rack, which means that I can toggle them on and off at the same time. So that's off. I'm really just hoping that I've kind of like added some clarity to this, not really level or anything. Okay, so as far as a mix goes, that's sounding pretty good to me. Um, I do think that at the end of this song, uh, the feedback really builds up. You can hear it. And I love the texture of the distortion, but it's just too much, right? So I think we can solve that by automating the level there. So if I press A, that should open up my automation lanes. I don't really like drawing it in like that. But, let's see how it sounds. See, I've used Adobe Illustrator for years, so I'm much more comfortable using kind of like a um, vector style point and Bezier curve, but I can't remember the shortcut to switch back to the other tool. So, it's B. It's the the letter B. <laughs> That's what I needed. So B is going to switch me back and forth between tools that I'm comfortable with and tools that I'm not. I liked generally how this went, but I could feel that it kind of stair-stepped through it, and I wasn't a fan of that. So hopefully simplifying that curve will do the trick. Okay, yeah, so that sounded good. i um, pretty happy with that, and I think, I think it's time to print it and master this thing. So one thing I forgot to mention is that when you're doing a mix, it's pretty important to listen to the mix on a different set of speakers or headphones, um, just so you can hear it in a different environment and, and make an assessment of your mix. And so I burnt that track off and loaded it up on my phone and listened to it on these headphones. Uh, which I know pretty well. Um, these ones 
kind of tend to hype the low end a bit, which uh, I expect. So I'm used to listening to music on these and just listen to the track and it's sounding pretty good to me. Um, everything's more or less how I want it. Uh, the edits all make sense and uh, the, sorry, that's a motion light. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, and the automation on the end really works well. So uh, I think I'm gonna call this mix done and just get straight into mastering. So I'm back in my studio space. Uh, I listened to the song a few more times while it's outside and decided that, yeah, I was pretty satisfied with the edits that I made and the overall mix. So I've uh, burned that song, uh, saved the file, and now I'm doing something that's probably a little out of the ordinary, uh, but this is what I did to make sure that the album that I just finished all kind of fit together. Everything had the same vibe. So I've opened up this project file here that has all of the tracks from the album kind of all stacked up and lined up. And so I'll just grab this new export, drop it into its own track here. And the reason that I uh, did this was so that I can just bounce quickly back and forth between all of the mixes and make sure that they all have the same general vibe. So yeah, so I'll start playing through the mix and just bounce over to some of these other tracks. Before I get too deep into this, I'm going to make sure that the levels are all fairly similar. Because earlier I was saying when, when one thing's louder, your brain tricks you into thinking that it sounds better. So I want to make sure that everything's I'm kind of paying attention down in the corner here to the level meters. Just to make sure that they're bouncing in the same area. Generally, it's looking okay. Okay, so I've just kind of bounced around in this track list and um, felt like uh, this new mix could still use a little bit of high end. So I uh, just put like a gentle slope raising up to give it a little bit more, um, a little bit more presence in the high end. And now I'm going to listen through the track in, in its entirety to make sure that the, uh, the mix sounds good. But I feel like it's kind of fitting in generally with the rest of the tracks. Okay, cool. Yeah, I just listened to the entire track and um, like I said, I gave it a little bit more top end and... I really think it sounded good uh, brought out, actually. Like, I really enjoyed listening to it, so that's a good sign. Um, normally, something like this is what would happen in mastering, right? Like, um, a mastering engineer would take a handful of tracks and work to kind of bring them into the same sonic landscape. Uh, but since I was my own mastering engineer on this, I kind of folded this into the mixing stage. So all of my tracks were kind of balanced in this way before I started mastering them. So I basically call this the final mix and then uh, export this as is and use that as my baseline for the mastering stage. Uh, so I'm going to take a pause here uh, while this exports and then continue on. Right, so I just finished exporting the final mix and I'm ready to move on to mastering. And while you can master your tracks yourself and all of the software like this has the tools that you need to do it, um, I think that you really do benefit by uh, sending your tracks to a third party mastering uh, service. Uh, almost everywhere you look online, you'll run into that advice. And uh, I, I agree with the advice. And while I did master my album myself, 
I I wish I I wish I knew somebody that would that could do it for me. I wish I had that sort of relationship with somebody. Um, and so, actually, for this video, I reached out to a guy named Gregory, who I met on the uh, Sinstrom Facebook group, who's a mastering engineer, and I I asked him if he'd be willing to master this track, and he agreed. So I'm really excited to see what he's going to do with it, and I'm going to continue on and master it myself. And at the end of this, we can A-B compare uh, the difference between, you know, my my home mastering kind of amateur attempt at it and uh, sending it off to somebody else. And uh, maybe it'll be better, maybe it'll be worse, I don't know. Um, it'll be interesting regardless, and uh, I'm super excited to work with Gregory. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to, actually just take a break. I think my ears need a break and uh, come back to this tomorrow. Um, and in the meantime, I'll send the track off to Gregory and see how it goes. So see you tomorrow. <laughs>